Welcome to Ask the Expert, featuring leading neurologist and muscle physiologist, Dr. Stephen Cannon. In this episode of Ask the Expert, we cover some of the more frequently asked questions of this video series. Remember, the content in this video is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician with any questions regarding a specific medical condition. There, there's kind of a, like a Venn diagram or a hierarchy where at the top, there's all of periodic paralysis, which means I have recurrent episodes of severe weakness. That's periodic paralysis. Then some of those are because of secondary, it's secondary to a problem in another part of the body, like an endocrine problem that causes metabolic changes to the way your body handles salts and you have recurrent episodes of weakness. You fix the endocrine problem and it goes away. There are other, the forms of periodic paralysis that we're focusing on here are all inherited genetic diseases. So one name that has been applied is familial periodic paralysis because it runs in families to mean that it's genetically inherited. Others have used the term primary periodic paralysis. And that's to distinguish the fact that that approach towards symptom management is appropriate for the familial or genetic type, not for secondary periodic paralysis, for example, from an endocrine problem or licorice intoxication or severe nausea and vomiting, things like that. Pharma had the initiative to emphasize the point it is primary to muscle. It's a primary paralysis. Most clinicians were used to the concept of familial because it runs in families and is a genetic basis. So then within the familial forms of periodic paralysis is hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, hypokalemic periodic paralysis, the Anderson to Will syndrome, and thyrotoxic periodic paralysis associated with thyroid disease. So there are four types of periodic paralysis. The thyrotoxic type is uh, kind of on the border between uh, a secondary system being the thyroid gland as opposed to a primary uh, disease of muscle. So implied in the term secondary weakness, the way to approach that is fix the primary problem, which is a problem with a different organ system. As rare as inherited periodic paralysis is, secondary paralysis is a, is a rare disorder. It, usually, it doesn't come just because, oh, I took a little too much diuretic or my diet isn't great. I mean, usually someone has been on very harsh chemotherapy and there's a profound disruption in the electrolytes in the body, or they've had a surgical procedure where the bowel has been diverted and so the absorption of, of nutrients and, and, and fluids is off, or somebody has a severe kidney disease and they're losing electrolytes, that's the salts in the blood are, are being lost. It usually takes a really severe disturbance of the electrolytes in order to have secondary paralysis. And so while individuals might be concerned about this as a possibility, the diagnosis of this secondary paralysis is usually achieved immediately in the emergency department because the blood values are so out of whack Every emergency room physician knows, oh, this weakness is secondary to the, to the fact the electrolytes are so abnormal here, we've got to resuscitate this person with intravenous fluids and they will get better. You know, this idea captures the attention of people searching for an answer. I have recurrent episodes of weakness, it's frustrating, my doctor doesn't understand it, my employer doesn't understand it, and I see that this can happen if you have electrolyte disturbances. That's true, but it's rare and usually happens only under extraordinary conditions. And so that's fortunate that, that most people um, are not going to be susceptible to that condition and most physicians will recognize it immediately. But it's important to separate that um, from periodic paralysis. So myotonia is very important in the big picture of periodic paralysis because the presence of myotonia is one of the most reliable distinguishing features between hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, which frequently has myotonia, and hypokalemic periodic paralysis, 
which does not have myotonia. In fact, myotonia is be regarded by most as an exclusionary criteria for the diagnosis of hypokalemic periodic paralysis. It's very important to make the distinction between hyper, that is high potassium, and hypo, low potassium periodic paralysis, because the recommendations for management to reduce the likelihood of an attack or the severity of an attack is polar opposites, depending on whether someone has hyperkalemic or hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So in a real world sense, it's important to make this distinction between these different types of periodic paralysis, hyperkalemic and hypokalemic. Because of the extensive overlap of the symptoms in paramyotonia congenita or hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, different family members might have received either diagnosis from their clinician. And in fact, the results of genetic testing may come back with the words hyperkalemic periodic paralysis or paramyotonia congenita in the report form from the gene testing. Don't be concerned by that. That's not an inconsistency. There is so much overlap between these two conditions that many experts consider them to be manifestations of the same disorder. They are both caused by mutations in the same gene. They share a common functional defect of the mutant channel, and they both respond similarly in terms of their treatment and prognosis for expected level uh, of impact on activities of daily living. So for families out there who've heard both of these terms, don't be concerned, oh my gosh, lightning struck twice, we have two different rare conditions. No, paramyotonia congenita and hyperkalemic periodic paralysis are, if you will, different flavors on the same spectrum of hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. Common disorders that are uh, confused with periodic paralysis uh, would be things like uh, functional neurologic disorder, a condition where there's a problem with the performance of the motor system, but all of the testing, the blood tests and MRI, uh, electrical tests of the muscle are all normal. Um, so we can't identify an abnormality, and there's no gene defect in functional neurologic disorder. Others that um, would go along with this are conversion reaction. This is a well-described psychiatric uh, diagnosis where as a maladaptive response to a real stress, um, losing a loved one, divorce, moving, that that stress is manifest in an unusual way which is, happens for this individual to be weakness. Uh, other ways could be, for example, a panic attack, feeling like you're going to die, short of breath, rapid heart rate. These are examples where the psychological state can impact performance of different uh, organ systems, and muscle strength is one of those. So a conversion reaction uh, is another diagnostic consideration. These are not easy distinctions to make. It requires time, repeated uh, visits to the doctor, keep revisiting the topic, extending the conversation, meeting other family members, uh, and as we'll mention, performing certain diagnostic or electrical tests of the muscle, uh, which can be extremely helpful, don't always provide the definitive answer, but continue to get better and better uh, as our diagnostic tools improve. If you would like to know more about periodic paralysis, visit periodicparalysis.org. And if you enjoyed this video and want more, hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and hit that bell so you don't miss any future videos. It really does help spread the word. You can view other videos about periodic paralysis by clicking the thumbnails to the right. If you have questions, just leave a comment below or reach out to us on social media. We'd love to hear from you.